Good evening, this is Dr. John Bennett from Miami Beach, televising on neurosurgical.tv. Uh, we're broadcasting a series of Achieving Mastery in Aneurysm Micro Neurosurgery uh, with uh, Dr. Ali Kristen and Dr. Lutton. And we'll, it's being translated into Chinese by Dr. Lee. And we'd like to welcome especially the Chinese audience. And we'll turn it right over to Ali. Go ahead, Ali, it's all yours. Thank you, John. Thank you everyone for those who came back and for those who just joined us. This is a series that, uh, this is our fourth session, uh, myself and Dr. Lawton, Michael, on the different types of aneurysms. And uh, today's uh, discussion on paraclinoid aneurysms. It's one of those aneurysms that uh, has uh, for a longer time been a challenge for neurosurgeons and I think Nowadays, it's, uh, it's kind of been unlocked and it's one of the uh, more fun aneurysms to clip in a way. And today we'll be going over our perspectives of how to approach it myself and, uh, and Michael. So uh, without uh, taking much time, I'll uh, let Michael start. And again, like I mentioned before, he doesn't need much introduction. Michael? Uh, you're you're muted. Okay, now we can hear you. Okay, good. Good to see you, Ali. You look uh, like you're doing well. It's not really dark there in Arkansas, is it? Uh, just barely that. <laughs> All right, let me go ahead and share my screen. All right, um, do you see my title slide? Yes. Okay, and is it presenter view or just the title? Uh, well, it looks good, whichever it is. <laughs> okay. Well, um, so today we're gonna talk about um, ophthalmic and paraclinoid aneurysms. And um, as uh, just by way of introduction, um, you know, I think these are one of the more complicated aneurysms to learn. Um, they're not like the other aneurysms that we've been talking about that just sit there in the subarachnoid space. They're um, uh, deeply embedded into this little um, triangular uh, pocket of anatomy. And it's really, um, I think, um, a challenge to learn the anatomy and to um, deal with aneurysms in this uh, region because um, you, you lose certain key things like proximal control and visualization and maneuverability. So, um, it, it's definitely a, a step up in uh, uh, degree of difficulty. So um, these are just some initial slides to get everybody on the same page. Um, here you can see the uh, normal ophthalmic artery anatomy. You see that it's the first branch off of the uh, communicating, or, sorry, the ophthalmic segment of the carotid artery. Just as it goes to, uh, past the distal dural ring, the artery comes off and it, um, rises up and bends forward into the optic canal. So this is your classic anatomy, but there's a lot of variation. Um, these are some of the variants. Here is a um, ophthalmic artery that arises from the cavernous or C4 segment. You can see it really at the beginning of the siphon before it makes that turn and it runs forward and into the cavernous sinus almost underneath the siphon. Uh, here you can see a clinoidal origin. In other words, more proximal to the distal dural ring where it pops through the floor of the canal and then joins the optic nerve. And here's another example of where it sort of bends around uh, and in. So you see um, these variations and um, not only these, but sometimes you'll see different layers of dura that invest both sides of the ophthalmic, which really uh, confuse the anatomy. Um, and you have to be careful because uh, if you end up doing your ring dissection and you cut across the ophthalmic, it uh, will be, uh, quite a surprise. These are just some nomenclature of the segments of the carotid. Uh, I like this Van Loveren classification where the C1 segment is the cervical portion. The um, carotid canal portion here is the C2. You've got your um, petroclival ligament here um, um, 
which is the end of the C3 segment, the Lacerum segment, very short. C4 is the cavernous, the C5 is the clinoidal, and then your supraclinoid segment is um, bisected by PCOM into the ophthalmic segment here and the communicating segment there. So these are um, part of the lang language of talking about these aneurysms. And what we'll be talking about primarily are those that are in the C5 and the C6 uh, segments. So uh, this is uh, a really instructive um, uh, slide because it shows you some of these relationships. The um, C5 segment, which is really at the heart of all this, is right here. And you can see here the distal dural ring on the uh, top of that clinoidal segment. You can see the proximal ring here on the bottom part of the segment. And between the two rings is this um, clinoidal segment. They're not actually rings. We talk about them as proximal and distal rings. But in fact, these are layers of dura that intersect the carotid. So until you cut them into rings, they're really layers. And these layers are on the top here and on the bottom here of the anticlinoid process. So you really um, uh, have to remove the bone in order to even begin to see the layers. And then you have to cut around them to form them into these rings that we, we talk about. Um, so this gives you a nice lateral view. You can see um, here a posterior view. And here you can see um, uh, an anterior view. So different perspectives showing this relationship. Uh, key arteries or key branches are the ophthalmic here and the hypophyseal here running to the pituitary uh, stalk and also the uh, undersurface of the chiasm. Now, um, the bone uh, is really important. This is a view of the um, uh, sphenoid bone and you can see the anterior clinoid process here. Uh, this is what we're talking about. And when you think about its attachments to the um, skull base, you have an attachment here on the lesser wing of the sphenoid. You have an attachment here medially where it bridges to the optic canal. And then you have the optic strut um, underneath here. And I'll show you these in different views. This is the view of the optic canal. So you're looking right down the barrel here. Your clinoid is over here. So here's your sphenoid ridge. Here's your bridge to the optic canal. And here's your optic strut. So you can see the three points of, of um, attachment, and each one of these needs to be broken in order to do your clinoidectomy. Uh, here's a nice view of the superior orbital fissure, which runs underneath that lesser wing of the sphenoid and um, transmits the nerves here. And looking here at the optic strut, this is another view. We're looking kind of in line with the optic nerve, and you can see this um, bridge of bone that buttresses the optic or the um, anticlinoid from underneath. So uh, really important to always visualize those three bony attachments and um, think about those as you're breaking the clinoid free. Here's a classic rotin picture. You can see the clinoid bone here uh, in situ. You can see the um, uh, uh, superior orbital fissure here, the optic canal here, and some of those points of um, adhesion that we've been talking about. And you can also see the layers as they sweep off of the clinoid and uh, course towards the carotid. Um, here, after all of that's been done, you can see the bone removal. You can see the layers, the incision of the layers, and then the formation of the rings. Here, the distal dural ring here. Here, the proximal dural ring. So um, uh, clinoidectomy um, can be done, obviously, extradurally or intradurally. These illustrations show the intradural clinoidectomy. Um, I, I uh, um, have generally favored the intradural approach just because not every ophthalmic um, or not every aneurysm needs a clinoidectomy. And when you get intradural, you can assess whether or not it's necessary. And so um, uh, you save yourself a lot of unnecessary clinoidectomy if you do these intradurally. On the flip side, uh, if you do them extradurally, it's a lot cleaner. You know, you just get the work done up front. Extradurally, the dura pro provides a protective layer, keeps any venous blood or bone dust off of the uh, optic nerve and the other structures. So it is cleaner, but um, again, the trade-off is that um, you're not always certain that you need it. And also, um, there is uh, some 
issue if uh, the clinoid is really close to the aneurysm and uh, you have some risk of uh, rupturing the aneurysm by doing your clinoidectomy, uh, then in those cases, if it happens extradurally before you've had a chance to really get intradural and to explore everything, uh, you can really be caught uh, behind the eight ball if, uh, if that were to happen. So in general, I, I prefer now the extradural clinoidectomies when um, there really isn't that intimate relationship with the aneurysm. And I know that the clinoid removal is going to be absolutely necessary. So uh, in those cases, I, I now prefer the extradural. Um, here are the steps. This is the dural incision um, along this, the lesser wing of the sphenoid and then across the canal over to the medial aspect. You can flap these dura, dural leaflets to expose the bone. I like to do the optic canal unroofing initially because um, that way you give breathing room to the optic nerve and any kind of pressure or manipulation on the tissue, uh, which I try to minimize, um, but any pressure that is there, you know, you've created space for it to tolerate it. So I do that first. It's also a great landmark. You can see that lateral edge of the sheath, and that tells you the um, uh, medial border of the anterior clinoid uh, process, and you can uh, go from there. Uh, generally, I like to cavitate here just to debulk uh, the bone, and then um, work on those points of adhesion, laterally, medially, and down here at the strut. And when you have those three points of attachment uh, broken down and disassembled, then you can remove the clinoid. You're left with this prominence of the strut, and then it's just a matter of um, drilling further and further medially. Uh, typically, you have to start cutting those layers. You go across the um, dural layer uh, over the uh, carotid and underneath the optic nerve. And with each snip of your scissors, you're getting further along here, and it exposes more and more of the strut. So you progressively snip and then drill and snip and drill, and you work your way all the way underneath the ophthalmic artery and into that medial space. So um, that's sort of the process. And you can see here at the end of it all, um, you can take the strut all the way down to its insertion into the sphenoid bone. And that uh, takes you all the way into the carotid cave on the medial side. Um, the last part uh, is usually this lateral dissection of the ring going around the lateral aspect and underneath. And then as you make this circle, uh, you can meet in the middle and this whole clinoidal segment then becomes mobile and it can, and pull, it can pull out of the carotid canal and you get um, the uh, mobility to visualize your anatomy and pathology. Um, this is a great picture because it shows you the slant of the, the distal dural ring. Here you're looking from an endonasal perspective with the stalk here, the chiasm here, the optic nerve here. And um, here's the ophthalmic artery. You can see that classic uh, course up and then into the optic canal. And from this medial perspective, you see how the dural ring just doesn't come straight around in a transverse way, but there's a slant. It's going both posteriorly and inferiorly. So you've got an angle. And so to cut back along this line, you end up working from underneath the ophthalmic in the what I call the axilla to uh, a point here where you can go no further. And you have to then transition to what I call over the shoulder, meaning you then have to go over the ophthalmic, under the optic nerve, and continue on in this direction to, to continue your course, your circumference around here. So that's a real important transition that you'll see in some of these uh, upcoming videos. Now, uh, the clipping, you know, the uh, Art Day always used to say there's um, one perfect clip for every aneurysm and for the ophthalmic. I think um, this side curve or side angle clip is that one perfect clip. Uh, it gives you um, a line of the blade that's more parallel with the carotid. It's not perfectly parallel, but by bending the blade uh, backwards, um, it gives you that angle. Uh, for larger aneurysms, you can use a tandem clip construct that allows you to uh, reconstruct the origin of the ophthalmic when it comes from the base like this. And then, of course, um, for um, more immediately projecting aneurysms like the classic superior hypophyseal artery aneurysm or um, a uh, clinoidal segment aneurysm that's pointing medially, these uh, encircling or fenestrated clips, right angle fenestrated clips are uh, the clip of choice for that. Uh, these are some of these um, constructs using fenestrated clips. You have the tandem clips, which are basically a stack 
which I like to place from proximal on the neck to distal on the neck. So you go um, toe to heel, you overlap the metal with the, with the toe underlapping the heel, and you just keep working your way back until you reach the end. Being really careful in this space here to uh, take care of the PCOM and the anterocoroidal artery and any other hypophyseal branches that are coming off. Other variations, these are the counter clipping facing clips where the you have two fenestration, uh, fenestrated clips in opposite direction, but here they're facing one another. Here's a counter clipping technique, but they're crosswise, meaning you're going heel to heel with the blades going in opposite directions. So a lot of different ways to do this. Um, this uh, is a nice clean way to march from one end to the other. Um, this is a nice way when you don't have a lot of space uh, to work your clips in and you just have this central region, almost like a T-bar clip. Uh, but uh, anyway, you can um, build these in, in a variety of different ways. Now, um, it seems everybody has their own way of thinking about the variations of paracliner and aneurysms. This is mine. Um, the, the most common ones are gonna be your ophthalmic and your hypophyseal right here in the middle. Uh, but uh, if you go distally, you're gonna have your dorsal carotid on this superior wall of the carotid. You're gonna have your ventral carotid um, or ventral wall aneurysm on the inferior wall. Um, and then of course, PCOM. So these are all anterior or proximal to PCOM. Now, if you go in the other direction more proximally, you're gonna have your clinoidal segment aneurysms that are between the rings. And um, you've got this cave aneurysm in that medial pocket um, down uh, um, in here. So um, these are basically six different variations. These will account for most of what you'll see, but just as an example, you know, the clinoidal segment uh, aneurysms come in a variety of different shapes and sizes. You can have those that um, project uh, laterally. We did one this week uh, that projected upwards laterally into the clinoid bone. You can have them project in the clinoidal segment downward into the cavernous sinus, and you can have them project medially into that carotid cave space. So uh, a lot of variations, even within this um, pretty basic uh, classification of six types. So um, I'm gonna show you just uh, a couple of cases to, um, uh, these are simple cases and uh, they're not meant to be, um, you know, uh, the biggest and baddest case. These are just to show some of these concepts. So here um, you can Showing see- Showing a slight medial projection. You can see uh, the aneurysm, a very simple one. There's nothing uh, very complicated about the clinoid bone. You know, I always look for pneumatization because that's um, uh, a factor that will affect your, um, your um, closure. Uh, and this is just a standard terional uh, incision and terional craniotomy approach. Some of the anatomy we've talked about. And here um, is the extradural clinoidectomy. You can see here uh, uh, removal of the bone. You can see um, uh, when it comes out, um, you get a little bleeding from the cavernous sinus, but I like to use that as an opportunity to um, inject some tissue. Um, this is my fellow uh, doing some of the, uh, or sorry, my chief resident doing some of the drilling here. But once we have the clinoid completely um, uh, taken care of, then uh, it's time to open the dura. And um, I really like Ali's uh, uh, vertical incision here right along the Sylvian fissure. You don't need much, takes you right down to the um, anatomy that's uh, of interest here. And uh, now you get right down to this uh, region where we're gonna start our ring dissection. So here is the optic nerve in this space. You can see the uh, dura of the clinoid and the dura of the optic canal uh, come together right there. And you can work your way into the optic canal and start dissecting that ring. Here you see our aneurysm, it's bowing the optic nerve. I like to save the arachnoid uh, as late in the dissection as possible. But here um, we continue our ring dissection. This is now working our way around the lateral side of the, uh, the ring. Here is the space underneath the optic nerve where the ophthalmic artery is coming off. And you can see it's a little bit um, lateral in its projection. Pretty nice, simple uh, anatomy. So I'm going to use a, a curved clip to give a nice view down the shank. You can see the distal blade here, proximal blade here. We're gonna deliberately leave uh, a little dog ear, but we can easily address that with additional clips. 
So this is an intersecting curve clip. We just follow the ring out and we slowly build this stack. And you can see that that nicely gathers in all of the, um, the aneurysm. Here's the last clip just on that last portion of the um, aneurysm tissue. And uh, the carotid artery is deep here at the tips of the blades. You can see the line of um, the aneurysm neck closure and here um, real nice uh, flow in the carotid that we see on icy green. So um, that's just a really simple basic uh, clipping case. Um, nothing fancy, um, just uh, showing the uh, extradural clinoidectomy, minimal uh, dural opening and um, uh, a fairly simple uh, stack clip construct. So um, I think the other nice thing about that is these um, uh, retraction system is really just these sutures that uh, pull back on the dura and it's a real nice way to, uh, to retract the, uh, uh, the brain. So uh, here's our next case. This is, um, this is a real problem. If you look at this case, um, what you see is um, the sphenoid bone here uh, uh, has a very large uh, sphenoid sinus and you can see a pneumatized optic strut. So the optic strut is this space here and you can see that that pneumatization goes all the way up into the anterior clinoid. Here's our aneurysm over here at the blue arrow. And uh, here is this thin eggshell of bone and all of this, um, what should be solid bone of the clinoid is, um, uh, is air. And so uh, we're, we're gonna have to deal with that. Here's the aneurysm itself. You can see your classic superior projection uh, of, the, uh, of the aneurysm. But uh, I want to show you the yo-yo technique is something that we developed to uh, address that. So there's the incision. There is the, um, uh, uh, the clinoidectomy that we've been talking about. And uh, here is uh, going to show you the intradural clinoidectomy. So uh, this is the view now uh, looking down into the carotid cistern. Uh, you can see that uh, I've made those dural flaps. And here, just with a little bit of bone removal, you can see I'm already into that pneumatized strut. The bone of the clinoid is really nothing more than just this thin little eggshell layer. So it's pretty easy to, um, to do our clinoidectomy, but you can see that we've entered into this sphenoid space. So here um, is the ring dissection. Here's the tissue of the dural ring. And uh, as we encircle the uh, layer here, we're creating that dural ring with these snips going laterally. So here you see the dural ring. Here's the aneurysm coming into view. This is our distal neck right here. We're gonna go across the optic nerve here to get um, the frontal lobe to peel back a little bit and create a little space. So here is the interoptic triangle. You can see um, sometimes this dissection here just elevates the frontal lobe nicely, gives you that extra um, visualization, that extra space. And now everything's in view. So um, here you can see that nice proximal neck. It, you create just enough room here under the optic nerve. You can see the um, uh, ophthalmic artery here. And this is an example of that side angled clip. So you see how the shank gets sort of bent out of your way. The blades are not parallel to the carotid, but they're more parallel than, uh, than if you would just use a straight blade. And now um, with the aneurysm essentially quiet, we can dissect it off of the optic nerve. You can see those last bits of adhesion. But uh, what, what you notice here is the aneurysm still has some, some fullness to it. And even though we do our endocyanin green and we see no dye getting into the aneurysm, um, you'll see in just a moment how this aneurysm is still alive. This goes to show you how you um, need to puncture these aneurysms and um, just confirming that the aneurysm uh, is no longer filling. And with a little cautery and a stacked booster clip here, we can close that extra little bit. Sometimes the clips just need an extra squeeze to get the tissues together. So aneurysms addressed, uh, 
this was just a little, uh, we were exploring a small ACOM abnormality, um, but nothing there. And oh, now, uh, how do we deal with that pneumatized strut? So we've got, um, we've got um, temporalis muscle uh, in view. So uh, the way we uh, do this, you don't wanna just stuff muscle into that space because if you do, uh, it's just gonna fall into the wider region of the sphenoid. You see that muscle can just disappear and it does nothing to, to form a plug. But if you've pre previously tied this lasso around the muscle and you pull it in the opposite direction up into the intracranial space, you see how you create this plug. This yo-yo technique is essentially pushing the muscle down and then pulling it back just as you would a yo-yo. And that creates this muscle plug that obliterates that, uh, that pneumatized sign. Uh, pneumatized optic strut. So here, here is the illustration. You get into this reverse funnel and what you've got to do is you've got to first, um, um, first get into that. Here we go. First get into that with this muscle plug with the lasso around it. And once you stuff it into that space and pull it in the opposite direction, you now have the, uh, the plug that's going in the right direction. You get a nice tight seal around that. And then a little fiber and glue here uh, secures everything. So it's a real nice way to, um, to deal with that pneumatization problem. If you don't, uh, you're almost certainly gonna get uh, a uh, cerebrospinal fluid leak and uh, your patient will come back unhappy. So, um, so there you go, there's the, uh, the post-op views. You can see the side angle clip very nicely there. And, um, uh, and there you have it. So, um, let me show you one more case. Um, we've got uh, just a few more minutes left. This is going to be an example of a clinoidal segment aneurysm. So as we look at this CTA, uh, these typically sit right in this um, anterior portion of the cella. You can see uh, it's projecting uh, medially and a bit downward. Uh, if you look at the axial over here, uh, you can see uh, how it sits right there in the cella. And so... Um, uh, that's our challenge. These are these are tough because um, you've got to get all the way around the ring and fully dissect uh, this anatomy. So uh, once again, arterional uh, incision, arterial crany. Here's our steps here, and um, now this is a great example of how you know the aneurysm has no relation to the clinoid. So I'm going to do this extra durally. This is actually my chief resident doing the clinoidectomy uh, that you can see here, um, nice removal of the clinoid and that um, exposes the uh, optic canal, it exposes this region here and um, all right, so now uh, moving further along here, we're, we're now on the portion of the case for the ring dissection. So, um, this is our uh, dissection of the ring. Now we're going over the top of the optic nerve, just once again to peel back the uh, frontal lobes and get a little bit wider view here. And as we look at the ophthalmic segment of the carotid, we see no aneurysms. It's all uh, buried in this medial space. So what we really have to do here is do uh, a much more aggressive ring dissection. This is that um, progressive drilling of the optic strut. You can see how we just go further medially and keep taking optic strut. And as we keep uh, removing the bone, we get to this layer of the dural ring. This is that carotid canal portion that we can start to peel the carotid out of. Now we're going uh, laterally around the carotid and underneath. So this is getting uh, around the 360 degree circle of the ring dissection. And here, you notice that I'm over the shoulder of the ophthalmic artery. And here is the um, hypophyseal uh, artery uh, coming off. So we've got to be really careful of that, these little branches that nourish the nerve. And as we transition, we're going from over the shoulder of the um, ophthalmic to, um, uh, sorry, from under the, uh, in, in the axilla of the ophthalmic to over the shoulder. And so as we go over the shoulder, we get around into this medial pocket and free that uh, artery completely. 
So here's our first clip going on. This is going to be an angled fenestrated clip. You can see the fenestration around the carotid. You can see the medial blade that slid underneath the hypophyseal vessel and into this medial portion here. The lateral blade is on the lateral side here. And as we inspect, you can see that the, the heel of the fenestration is not fully across. So we need one more clip to stack underneath. And that completes um, our closure on the backside. But it's not quite right. You got to snug it a little bit further forward. You see we lift the blade and we slide it a little bit further. So we've got overlapping metal. And that takes care of the back portion of the neck. And now as we inspect, you can see a good flow of the carotid artery through the fenestrations of the clips here. Good, uh, oops, sorry. There we go. I wanted to show you the, the flow on the icy green of these little vessels that supply the nerve. Very important to see that. And that's why it's so important to preserve that arachnoid over the optic nerve as you do this dissection here just inspecting the, the course of the blades on that medial side. And you can see how here's the siphon, here's the clinoidal segment. You almost don't see the aneurysm at all because it projects medially. And um, uh, here, uh, this just shows you the application of the blades. So it's a, it's a tough space to expose, but um, uh, you can see how that dissection takes you right there. All right, so um, with that, I think I'm gonna go to my last slide um, and just give you a couple of closing thoughts. You know, um, these paraclinoid aneurysms, um, as you can see, they're, they're really challenging and they're actually a lot of fun to do. Um, they're fun because there's endless variety. Um, you have all different sizes and shapes. We've talked about the different classifications and the different uh, relationships to the um, rings. And so you, you really, um, have to be on your game to really understand this. Uh, so I, I find these to be a lot of fun, um, but they're also very difficult. And um, I think in today's uh, era where we have flow diversion as a uh, pretty effective alternative to open surgical clipping, there, there is a, uh, a real competition for this particular aneurysm. I think on our side, um, our biggest uh, issue is patient vision. You know, we, we have such a intimate relationship of the optic nerve and the aneurysm itself that vision is at risk. We've published on this um, extensively looking at uh, our visual outcomes in over 200 patients and there is a risk. It uh, varies from uh, uh, anywhere from a couple of a per percent to um, fairly high in the literature. Ours was around four and, a, four and change percent risk of uh, a visual change with, uh, with these aneurysms and it goes up with the larger um, more complicated aneurysm, but that's the real risk on the surgical side. On the flow diversion side, um, there's the issues of um, anticoagulation and platelet uh, inhibition um, and uh, efficacy over time, but um, I think it's proven itself to be a, a fairly effective uh, alternative. So it really means that we have to um, be on the top of our game and get the best results. Um, I throw this uh, graph in here. Um, it's a little bit dated now, but you can see that over time, um, um, the, the numbers continue to grow, uh, ophthalmic hypophyseal and clinoidectomy. Um, th this is an incredibly valuable skill to have. I view it in much the way I view Sylvie and Fisher splitting. Uh, it's just one of those real essentials. If you're gonna do aneurysm surgeon, su surgery, you have to know how to split the fissure well and get into that gateway down to the circle of Willis. Well, if you're gonna do proximal carotid aneurysm surgery, uh, you have to know clinoidectomy really well and be able to do this with, um, with very little risk to vision. So uh, that I think is our challenge ahead. So uh, that's uh, what I wanted to cover. Um, I'm gonna stop my share and turn it over to Ali. All set, Ali. Thank you. 
Chris, you are muted. There you go. Okay, can you see uh, my screen now? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Michael. That was a, a, a great overview about the, the uh, anatomy of that region. And as Michael mentioned, this is one of those areas that you really need to uh, be very comfortable and master the anatomy of it. And then uh, the, the surgical clipping of these aneurysms becomes much easier. I'll even go one further step with a, a statement these are the most easy aneurysms to clip once you master exposing them. The actual clipping step is not complex, but once the exposure is done, the real trick is how to make them ready to be clipped. And once that's achieved, that's it. Then the 90% the, uh, of the battle is, is won in a way. I want to show this graph I have a large number of these cases and of the uh, 270, now they're getting close to 280, 290 uh, aneurysms. Look at this number. There is a good number of cases that we did not clip. And this is the most common aneurysm that I don't clip as well. There's about 15 to 20% that occur in that region that you don't have to necessarily clip because the risk of them bleeding, especially in an older person, immediately small projecting aneurysm, I would tend to follow it. And, uh, and uh, the, the, you know, they, unless they are causing problems. Now, I like to look at them for surgical purposes in four uh, types. The most common are the superior and inferior type. As Michael mentioned them, the ophthalmic, which is all the true ophthalmic. These are the superior paraclinoid. And then the inferior type, which starts very adherent to the ring, the, pro, the distal ring, and then they grow either posteriorly like this or medially. Now, me and Evandro, Dr. De Oliveira, we didn't believe that there is superior hypophysial large aneurysms. They're usually small. I think those ventral ones, when they project medially, and the trick to it, if you see those perforators, the hypo uh, the, the, the superior hypophysial perforators, they're above it. The true superior hypophysial is above the aneurysm on the medial side, and I'll show a picture of it. The other type is, those are the medial ones. There is two variants. The true superior hypophysial that you see here, which you see a small one, and they're usually distal to the takeoff of ophthalmic, and the, the superior hypophysial comes from underneath while the more proximal one at the level of the ophthalmic artery are what's called the carotid cave aneurysms in a potential space in that region. Then there is a lateral group, and that lateral group is the type that grows at the level of the ring, and if it can grow largely intradural or largely extradural or equally, and I'll show some picture. And this can be mistaken as two aneurysms because the ring cuts it in half, but when you expose them, they become one aneurysm. And that's one way to look at it. And again, there are a lot of ways of, uh, they were described, but, uh, uh, you know, Evandro, for example, wanted to only include superior and inferior. And, you know, we all have our perception of it, but to me, the surgical steps are different for these different ones, although they're in the same Region. So the most common is the type one, which is the superior type followed by the inferior, and then the uh, other ones, the lateral and the medial ones. Now, M uh, Michael mentioned, uh, you know, his uh, points, and and I agree with him. There are cases, and I have many cases that I didn't have to do them uh, with a lot of. Uh, like extra dural work because you do you just have to open the falciform ligament and throw the clip. You just have a small opening. Uh, I do remove the sphenoid wing to create space because I like like he showed nicely to open the dura very close to the aneurysm. I don't like to see the brain. It just makes a difference in the patient's condition post-op. But these are 
the points I uh, kind of have an advantage of the extradural approach that I like to mention. You create a pretemporal wide view and you have a high, wide corridor where you can maneuver your, your clips. The drilling is done outside. There's a protection. You're not in direct contact with the carotid or the brain. So there is a dural barrier. The blood is less. I hate blood in the subarachnoid space. So I like all the blood to be clean outside. Uh, in case of brain swelling, uh, you don't have a swollen brain in your way when you're drilling extradurally. And uh, at the same time, the uh, uh, when you put temporary clips, if you open widely and you have a clinoidal control, and sometimes I'll show some cases, I even go to the cavernous portion and put a clip. The clips are not in the way when you are, especially when you're dealing with a large aneurysm. And, uh, and this becomes also more enhanced in your mind the more experience you have. No doubt, this can be complex if you don't understand it, but it's really simple once you're understanding. Just like I always say, complexity is due to ignorance and simplicity is due to knowledge. The more you know about the anatomy, the easier it becomes. Michael mentioned very nicely the different points. This is just an illustration of the surgical anatomic connections or parts of the clinoid. This is not true anatomic because this is a continuous bone, but when you remove the sphenoid wing from the orbital roof, then you're left with the optic roof and optic strut and then this is what makes the clinoid an island. You, know, you can take it out. And try always to drill the clinoid. Don't try to remove a big clinoid. Sometimes there's a little spine that goes under the carotid. You can easily injure the carotid if you don't pay attention. So you have to understand the anatomy of the dural folds very clearly as it relates to this region, because you have to see this picture in your mind before you get in there. So when you have a view like to me, this view, the, the reason I feel comfortable with the extradural approach, I never worry about uh, the rupture of the aneurysm, although it's a good point that like Michael said uh, to keep in mind, but uh, you have to be able to see the picture that is behind it. And then when you are able to see this, then everything becomes much more under your control in a way. And that's the view you have to achieve in the majority of patients, so you have safety. So I'll take examples, go from simple to more complex one. This is a superior type. You see how it looks? Both the clinoidal and supraclinoidal are under the aneurysm. When it enlarges, it looks like this. And notice here, there's like a flat part. That's where the optic nerve is. This is a little bit medially projecting. You can see the picture, how it is on this side. And in those cases, if you don't clean the ring well, it will create like a, a tight band around the carotid. So in the old days, and Michael can remember, those were very popular for intraoperative angiography because there was always a concern that you either close the carotid or you leave aneurysm. And the reason for that is nobody exposed the clinoid and removed it and took the dural rings. So you have the risk of either one, either over uh, treating or under treating. So the other variant, they can become very large is more lateral to the optic nerve. And these patients don't have as much deficits in a way. And they get buried into the frontal lobe like this and, and they get very large size sometimes. So I take an example. This is a patient presented to me with a scotoma. And so it, this was poking into the optic nerve. You can see how medial it is. And this is the steps, this is the, I'll do it extra dural. And if you notice here, this is the carotid, this is the optic nerve, this is the orbit. And I create space by dissecting laterally at the towards almost to V2. So I have more space. Now this is what I'm opening here. There is a ligament that goes under the third nerve. If you open it with the knife, it is furthest away from the carotid. It's like a little tent. So you don't risk cutting the carotid. And then this, the beginning of the oculomotor carotid membrane on the third nerve side, this is the left side. And then you clean it. And I use it also as a window to inject into the cavernous sinus. And it goes around the carotid, which makes it dry in a way. And then you clean and prepare it for the clip. So now I have full proximal control. 
and then I will open the Dura and as uh, Michael mentioned, I like to open it in a small area to go into the falciform ligament. And you can see the field is clean because I did everything extra durally. And you can see the aneurysm poking into the uh, optic uh, nerve. See that? And that's what was causing that spot. And this is the ophthalmic artery. You have to be careful. Sometimes it takes off from the neck. And the clipping, like you see, it's the easiest part. And uh, once you get the proper exposure, and you can see how much space I have because I went more pretemporal in a way. And you can see how much this was poking into the, uh, uh, the uh, nerve itself. And that's kind of the, the view and the rest of the closure is a small area and, and then put a piece of fat or muscle towards the sun. If they get larger, believe it or not, the approach is gonna be the same. This is the window after opening it. We've done the work extra durally and opening along the falciform ligament. Once you get the exposure, the next thing is to open the distal control. Now, if you look here, this is supraclinoid carotid. This is the aneurysm here. This is the supraclinoid and clinoidal segment. And then the next thing is I'll open proximal sylvium fissure. I like to go to the A1 because the clips are away from where the uh, uh, where the uh, clipping process is happening. So now you can see this is clinoidal carotid. This is supraclinoid carotid. This is the proximal neck, distal neck, and this is ophthalmic artery, and that's the optic nerve. So you can see the anatomy, all of it, still and working under the brain in a way. This is the ophthalmic artery being exposed, cleaning around it very well because you want to see the course of it so it doesn't get. And like Michael said, in those cases, you have to go more distal, uh, I mean, more medial, so you can see very well the anatomy on the other side because a lot of these cases, they bulge on the medial side as well. Even though this is a superior type, it may have a bulge on the other type. So now you can see the optic nerve, the aneurysm, and all of it. This is the clip on the clinoidal segment. And then the next clip is going to go on the A1 segment. So this is A1. The bifurcation is at this point. And then from there on, you have good control. And one of the reasons I don't put a clip very proximal here because there's backflow from the ophthalmic, which can sometimes make the aneurysm swell in a way. So that that's allows the aneurysm to, to be compressed. So you I'm coagulating. And the next thing is to put your first clip. And uh, I want to give a word of caution. Never try to clip a large, bulky aneurysm without temporary clips. It's a recipe for rupture. I've seen it many times, and you don't want to do that. You always collapse it and somehow control it so you can get it out of the way. The rest of it now is, you know, reconstruction. Once you secured it, you start doing it. So you see the clipping part becomes easy once you get everything under control in a way. And uh, this will be like, you see, I'm reconstructing it because I took everything under the optic nerve. Now, this case used to be, I have many cases which were unfortunately uh, coiled and they lost vision. And that is a more serious problem with coiling if it's done. With pipeline, I'm still, you know, I, I, I see that there is reports of safety, but there is also a lot of things that are in a delayed fashion being uh, reported. Now, sometimes the aneurysm is hugging the clinoid. It is incorporated in it. In these cases, I go more proximal for control because we used to, to fear those aneurysms um, in, in case something happens prematurely. You can see how proximal it is. And these correlate with the location of the ophthalmic artery. The artery itself is uh, proximal. So in these cases, I go more, and this it, it takes a little bit extra time, about 10, 15 minutes. You can see the fourth nerve here and I go to the uh, Parkinson's triangle and just open it and get proximal control in the uh, uh, segment of the uh, 
transverse or the horizontal portion of the carotid. I have done this now many, many times. Again, uh, the, the idea of the cavernous sinus being this big juju that we have to be scared for, with from, it has to go away. This is part of our, our area that we operate on and we should be ready. So now I can remove the clinoids safely because I have proximal control and I'm drilling on top of the base of the aneurysm here. That's part of the aneurysm. You'll see it when I open. So, and this is the ligament which is under the third nerve, cut tangentially under it. And you see there is a, a like a little uh, tent. And this allows you to very early and away from the carotid start cleaning the oculomotor carotid membrane. And then once you get it ready, you see now I have the clinoidal cavernous loop. This is fourth and third nerve. And the rest of it will be the same steps. We open the dura clean around it. And what you'll notice now when we start opening is the aneurysm started here. And, and then it is, that's the ring. You see how it's incorporating part of the ring. And then the aneurysm is, that's the aneurysm coming from this part of the clinoid going this way, but buried, I'm sorry. I want to show you. And now we are mobilizing the aneurysm from the nerve. And look now the clipping. Clipping is the easiest part because this whole buried aneurysm became very nice, widely open. You can see the clinoidal, supraclinoid, and we achieved safety at all different levels. And now you just pick and choose until you get your perfect clip. And uh, this is the, again, the clip was in the way, the clinoidal clip, so I took it, put it in the cavernous portion, and then trying to finalize the clipping steps. Like I said, these are aneurysms which are really easy to clip once you expose them, because there is no perforators around, and their anatomy becomes clear once you do it. Now, they can be ventral like this when they get bigger. The trick here is you have to clean the proximal part where the ring is usually incorporated in it. And now these are the two types. This is the posteriorly projecting. If you look at it, it looks like a posterior communicating artery, but it's not. For the experienced eye, you can see the angiogram, it tells you that this patient had an AVM, as you notice, in this case. And if you look at the AP, only the clinoidal segment is see. The supraclinoid, you don't see it under the aneurysm like the ophthalmic ones because it's hiding behind it in a way because this thing is posterior to it like you see here and here don't confuse them you see this is you can see the proximal part and the distal part this is pcom and this is the ophthalmic i mean the uh, paraclinoid type when they go medially there's some uh, this is what is wrongly called the uh, superior hypophysia superior hypophysia should not have the superior hypophysia branches on top of it they should be under it, and I'll show examples of it. Again, this is important to see and understand it. Now, another point which Michael mentioned, you have to be careful when you put your clip. A lot of these aneurysms span the bottom part, half of the uh, carotid, and you don't want to include the uh, superior hypophysial branches. This is an example. This is left side. This is the optic nerve, ophthalmic artery, clinoidal, supraclinoid, the aneurysm is here. So now we're gonna change the angle to look from left to right. And as we do that, you will see now, that's, now you'll see the perforators is here. This is the optic nerve. And this is the beauty of the pretemporal route. I'm looking from totally lateral to medial, and I'm putting the clip under the ophthalmic, uh, under the carotid, but I can see my clip on the other side and you can see the perforator here and the clip underneath. So I, I have full clipping of the aneurysm, but at the same time, I under view, I saw everything. And like Michael said, in those cases, you have to clean circumferentially, but I can mobilize the whole carotid out of its gutter and you have full control on it. This is another one, uh, a, uh, you can see it, it's uh, 
it's the similar but larger uh, size, more proximal. And you can see how the clinoid is going to be hiding the proximal part. And for these, the same steps, we're cleaning the uh, carotid. We prepared it for the clip. And now we have full control. And then I will open and start dissecting the, uh, the iris. So again, look at this corner. When you inject, it comes usually around the... Uh, around the carotid. So this is the aneurysm. That's what I meant by the proximal ring. I mean, the, the proximal part of the neck, the ring is incorporated on it. If you don't clean this, then you, it's not going to close. That's why in the old days, they have difficulty with those aneurysms. They needed intraoperative angiography. Now, that other side, I will always look for it. Why? Because these aneurysms can sometimes bulge on the other side. This did not. But look how much mobilization I created. So now I'm cleaning to, to the other side. In, in this case, um, you know, you, I was going out of my way to clean. And, and then I cut this part of the attachment. And uh, suddenly, there is some oozing or bleeding from the aneurysm, which in this case, not a big deal. You just compress the aneurysm. And I have proximal control in the clinoidal segment. So I just put a clip and then slow it down. And many a times I don't put a distal clip and depending on the flow. But if that's the case, you have full control. It's in front of you. And still, look how much brain we have. But you've got plenty of space to, to maneuver around. Why? Because of this uh, route that we used pretemporally. And now the rest of it is I'm finishing my cleaning process. And now you can see it's free. And now I can put my clip, uh, you know, directly into it and under full view. So that's why clipping those aneurysms, I have to say it again, is easy once you expose them. The real uh, point is how to expose these aneurysms. It can be very big, but still the steps are the same. This patient had bilateral ventral aneurysms. You can see it, and we went to the right side. Same steps, the approach is the same, and we're removing the clinoid. I'll skip those. And then once you open, you can see the aneurysm, distal part, but you don't see the proximal part. It's all buried into this area. Now, this aneurysm has a medial part, you see how the optic nerve is bulging. And this is diligent exposure. Like Michael said, you need to go more medially. In these cases, you want to take the, the, the uh, optic strut to the other side, and you have to cut the dural ring 360 degrees around it. So once we get this exposed, and now the aneurysm, I put a clip on the uh, uh, I know the segment. Now, I want to make a point here. The reason I put the clip is because the, the ring, the dura ring attachment, if you remember, these are proximally attached to the aneurysm, is much easier to split if the aneurysm decompresses. To do that, to create that space between the residual ring and the neck of the aneurysm, you need to have the aneurysm deflated, otherwise you rupture it. That's why I put a temporary clip for the dissection of this part. You see that? I'm dissecting it. Now I'm compressing the aneurysm to away. The aneurysm is now here. See that? The aneurysm is here. And now I created that space around it. So then the next thing is to look further on the other side. You see how I mobilized the aneurysm, the car carotid completely out of its gutter. There is a perforator. You, see, you saw the perforator on the other side. And you will see my clip here. The suction is pushing the perforator, so the clip does not include it. And I am seeing 360 degrees around it. You see how much you mobilize the whole complex out of its gutter. The rest of it is a reconstruction process and reinforcing with a clip and then deflating it and so on. So uh, again, it is all about exposure and I'll just speed it up. And this is opening the medial side, collapsing the aneurysm. You can see the reconstruction towards the end and it is 
all them. Now, when they are more medial, like in this case, the clipping is a little different and Michael showed very nicely a case like this. In those cases, same, I do the exposure outside and once we open and clean all the anatomy in this case, um, then again, all this dura in this area has to be cleaned well. Because this is medial, then like Mike said, you have to really go out of your way to go very proximal and distal to see the aneurysm totally. This is A1. And now we did the distal part, now the proximal part. You take the falciform ligament all the way proximally and you clean the ring circumferentially. If you don't clean the ring circumferentially, you will not be able to close the clip without compromising the flow in the aneurysm or the clip will not close and the aneurysm will still be filling. So once we get this control, this is a clip on the uh, uh, A1 and then another clip on the clinodal segment. And this is the aneurysm. You can see it all in front of you, both. And this is, in this case, there was a large PCOM. So we put another clip on PCOM. And now you can see the whole aneurysm complex from inferior to superior, and that's the carotid artery in between. And you just do your reconstruction. And in this case, a fenestrated clip is applied and deflating the aneurysm and making sure you see how the reconstruction of the artery is very nice because you remove all the ring from around it. There is nothing left in it. And at the end, you just decompress it and, and you look around and make sure that nothing is included. And you can see that the artery is really uh, anatomically is reestablished as you can see here. So they can be very large, the same. This is the case I showed you earlier. Uh, the steps are the same, uh, removal of the clinoid. In this case, it was, again, the dura ring has to be cleaned fully from around it. The rest of it is reconstruction. And then once you finish, you can see the reconstruction in this case, a little bit more demanding, but you can see the artery be open. Now, the, the, the next thing, this is a post-op, but uh, this is the ones which I call the lateral type. The ring is sitting on the aneurysm. This is one aneurysm, but it looks like it is two. And I'll show you an example. This is how they look laterally in this case. And they can enlarge and become like this. They look like two aneurysm, but in reality, these are this is one aneurysm. This is an example, a case which is, look here carefully, it looks like one aneurysm, but the angiogram showed there is two. One, proximal to the clinoid, one distant to the clinoid. So when we do the exposure, and then you have to clean the ring from around it. In these cases, it is advisable that you do clean the, the uh, get proximal control in the cavernous sinus. Now, the clinoid here is an aneurysm, but it's okay. We clean around the clinoid, uh, the aneurysm, we clear um, around the carotid, we do. Now notice here what's happening. This is the intradural aneurysm. This is the extradural aneurysm where the clinoid was. I am cleaning the ring to make it as one aneurysm. So the next thing is look at that. It becomes one aneurysm. I'm cleaning the ring circumferentially. That's the, the part which was inside. And now you can see it is one aneurysm. You can see the difference in color. This is the clinoidal part, supraclinoid part. And then you put your clip. And this is the clinoidal supraclinoid continuity in a way. And that's how it looks once you reconstruct this. This is, these are one aneurysm. Uh, we get proximal control in the cavernous sinus. You see how they are buried sometimes inside the clinoid process. And they could be risky if you don't. And I think Roberto Hero's reported on those cases that they can go wrong. So 
let me just skip here. Now, the, uh, believe it or not, cavernous aneurysms, I have been pushed by Evandro. He kept saying, well, if, if, you, if somebody's gonna stent those aneurysms, why don't you clip them? I have clipped many. When I'm opening for a ophthalmic aneurysm, it so happened there's a clinodus one. And then, but we, we are able to do a lot of, uh, uh, you know, work for these cases. This is an example of a patient who was going blind. And you can see that this lady has this aneurysm. To me, this is a clippable aneurysm because it's a true aneurysm of the cavernous sinus. And in my opinion, there are two types of aneurysms, true aneurysms of the cavernous sinus and, and the fusiformish like aneurysm. This one is a true aneurysm. Now this patient also had an, uh, a basilar aneurysm that you can see here and also has a and this is the basilar aneurysm and has a client, a anterior communicating aneurysm. So anyway, this was not coilable or endovascularly treatable. So we decided to clip this, but my approach usually goes in the cavernous sinus. So we decided to go ahead and close it at the same time. So we just expose the usual, but in this case, we open widely in the cavernous sinus. And this is the carotid in the cavernous sinus. This is the fourth nerve and third nerve here. And then, sorry. So then we open here, I'll show you just, this is the supraclinoid carotid. And then in this case, we opened the neck and got proximal control. And then we remove the further distal one. And then we open, this is fourth nerve and third nerve, that's V1. We just deflated the aneurysm and then went ahead and reconstructed it. The next thing is to find the uh, proximal part, which is the ascending part. And you notice this is a, it, it's in, in our mind, it's the same like clipping any other complex aneurysm, like an MCA aneurysm, if you know the anatomy. This is the, this is the proximal part of the aneurysm. I mean, the uh, carotid and now we reconstructed it. And what we ended up doing in this case, and this is the finished part of the aneurysm. We put two clips and the carotid goes from here coming up this way. Let me just finish it fast. This is the reconstruction. You can see it with two clips. And this patient really had full recovery. There are multiple aneurysms. These are the types that we clipped many times, but I don't find the indication for it because I think these are benign aneurysms when they are interclinal. Now, why I showed this, there is no limit to what we can do with microsurgery if we master the anatomy and understand it very well. And it, uh, it'll be a shame because there will be a loss of opportunity for the better option in a lot of these patients. And we, we should pursue our uh, attempts at uh, keeping the best, most durable option. And like Ma Michael said, we have to elevate our game so that we compete easily with the other options and we are in a better situation. One thing about visual complications, which he mentioned, I know we went over time, but that's essential. We had severe visual loss in 2% of patients. These were new. Moderate in loss in three, and improvement or no change in 95%. Now, here's one thing. I had two patients in the first 100 cases, and I kept wondering what could have happened. And we went to the lab because, and we looked for what could be the cause? 
and there is a direct blood supply that comes from the ophthalmic artery to the nerve. And I think we haven't been paying attention to this. What's interesting, since we found this in the lab, and I start looking for that artery, I've yet to have one single patient with any visual problem in the last 150 or 60 patients. And I think that's an important point to, to make. Other than the fact that you have to do copious irrigation with cold irrigation and using the diamond drill. And another point uh, that I always do also is when I'm operating in that area, once I open the dura, I cover the optic nerve. The heat generated by the microscope could be very injurious. And I always keep a cottonoid uh, as, uh, all the time covering it. You, you cannot underestimate anything in order to protect the vision. I feel very optimistic about it. In our unruptured group, in this case, uh, we have a, a large number, about 150 or so. Notice the these patients, 99% of these patients within a year, they are doing great. I think you know, mastering the anatomy here is gonna create really a big plus for these patients. And like Michael said, this is our uh, a field that, that we should belong to and stay there. And uh, you spare the patient from you know, the, the problems with anticoagulation and antiplatelet therapy, which has its own risks. In addition, there is always a risk of some of these stents closing up and causing strokes. And I have patients like that. So we have to keep those in place. So I know we went a little bit over, but these are you know, uh, important aneurysms to, to regain back into our armamentarium because we can do a very good job for them. All right, I'll, I'll stop here. And uh, I think we can... Okay. okay. We'll go back to uh, Michael, if you wanna put your, uh, you come back from being mute. So Ahmad will give us a couple of questions. Yeah, thank you very much. Actually, there are a couple of questions, but mostly answered by the talks. Uh, maybe this is for Dr. Lawton. Any uh, other options for proximal control than the ones that Dr. Christ mentions? or proximal control? Well, um, yeah, I, I think they've all been mentioned. The, uh, the easiest um, uh, and the traditional is the cervical carotid cut down and exposure in the neck. I think um, the exposure of the clinoidal segment uh, gives you proximal control in some. The exposure, as uh, Ali showed, of the cavernous uh, C4 segment in Parkinson's triangle is another. Um, you know, there, there are others. You could do um, adenosine uh, if you needed just a short, brief uh, window of control. Um, there are others as well. There's been, uh, um, Dr. Spetzer used to talk about a Fogarty balloon catheter in the Petrus Canal that uh, you can inflate by slipping that into Glasscox Triangle. I mean, there, there's lots of clever ways to get control, but I, I don't think you need them. I think, um, you know, it's very rare um, I did my first carotid cut down for control on a case um, two weeks ago, and it, it's it's been uh, literally years since I've done that. Um, so I, I think you can get it elsewhere, and uh, you don't often need it, uh, but it's there's plenty of it uh, in these spaces um, that we've talked about. Okay, thank you. Now for the uh, medially projecting uh, aneurysm or the uh, superior hypophyseal. Uh, how to avoid the superior hypophyseal artery, and can we uh, use uh, ICG uh, to to view it after surgery? This is for Dr. Christ. Well, the first thing to, to do to to find the superior hypophyseal is you have to to know the anatomy of these arteries. There could be one or two or three of them, and uh, the way they project, they start just distal to the dura ring. Some of them even incorporate in the dura ring, so you don't want to underestimate them. They can be that early. And uh, the other thing is, 
um, in medially projecting aneurysm, I'm, I'm calling it because I don't like to call them sphere aprophysia because the large ones are the ones that stretch the arteries superiorly. If you have those in mind, you're going to find them, especially after you put the temporary clip and collapse the aneurysm. That's key. Why I'm saying that? Because they can be stretched and look like a fibrous band, and you may cut them, and they may not even bleed initially. And then later, you will realize that those were gone. So you need to look for them. And, and this could be one reason why we didn't have a lot of you know problems with, with vision uh, since we've done those, because I look for every, you have to know the anatomy of the blood supply of the nerves and the chiasm. They come from these, they can come directly from the ophthalmic artery like we've, we've shown, and uh, you don't wanna underestimate any little branch to save it, because that's the only way, other than the being gentle with the maneuvers, you can save the vision to the nurse. But, uh, and again, anatomy, anatomy, anatomy. Thank you. Maybe a couple of questions from the audience. Anybody had any additional question? Uh, I have a question to Michael. Uh, if you can elaborate on uh, adenosine, because that was a question last week too, I haven't, you know, used it. Uh, you have used it a lot. Uh, for some reason, I feel comfortable always finding some proximal control. A couple of times I've prepared to use it, ended up not using it. Do you have any experience, comments on it? Uh, yeah, I, I use it from time to time. Um, my biggest uh, beef with adenosine is just that um, it's a very short window. Uh, it gives you 30 to 60 seconds of um, a cardiac pause. Um, so it's not um, a real long window. I, I think for most of these aneurysms that we've been talking about, you need anywhere from two to five minutes to do those last few maneuvers to get the clips on. And so adenosine falls a little bit short in that time window for it. Um, but, you know, I think when you're in trouble and um, um, you need a little help quickly. It's it's a real easy thing. You just call for it, and your anesthesiologist can just give it as a push. Um, I haven't had any trouble with um, uh, needing, like for example, uh, defibrillation to restart the heart or anything like that. I think it's been safe in my experience, but um, um, I, I just haven't. Um, I, I don't use it routinely because it's not um, as good or as long lasting. I, I do think that, um, as Ali stressed, the um, uh, use of temporary clips proximal to the aneurysm is much better and much more definitive. So um, that's the way to go, really. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Okay, well. Uh... I think that covers it well, so. All right, well, I think uh, just to mention, we're going to be off next week. It's uh, spring break, so we'll be spending time with our families. And uh, thank you for everybody who attended. And uh, we will be seeing you the week to follow, whereby we will go over the basilar aneurysms. And then there will be one more session at the end on pericolosal and pica aneurysms. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Michael. Thank okay. you, John. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, th thanks everybody. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Lee, the translator for Chinese. Oh, oh yeah, Kai Lee. Yeah, Dr. Lee, are you, are you there, Dr. Lee? I'd like yes, to say yes, thank yes. you. Yeah. Um, you, hi, everyone. I'm Kai Lee, and uh, thank you for letting me translate this webinar. And uh, there are over 1,000 audience uh, in China. So we are all grateful for the opportunity to learn. And thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank, Thank you, you. Okay, very good. Okay, we'll see everyone in two weeks. Thanks, everyone.